If you're ever in our area, we want you to know that you're welcome to come along. We'll make you feel right at home. And so we've been on this series talking about our identity. If you know who you are in life, you will go far. If you discover your potential, if you discover what you've created, been created to be, why God has put you on this big rock, why God has allowed you to breathe, why He has blessed you, why you are on this planet, you will go so much further when you discover who you are. That's why we've been talking about I am. And we're talking today about I am strong. And there's times in life we go through situations where we're out of our comfort zone. We're out of our depth of water. I'm five foot six. I'm not a very tall person. And I remember when I first started swimming, the water was always over our depth, over my head. Anybody ever been somewhere where they're over their head in the water? Well, I, I felt like it was a scary situation. You know, when you go on in life and you just, just start to think, man, I'm not ready for this. It might be I'm not ready for marriage or I'm not ready for business or I'm not ready for that promotion at work or whatever it is. You feel like you're out of your league. Well, God's strength is there to be on your side. And that's when we read in the, the, the Bible, it speaks in the book of Habakkuk in chapter 3, verse 19, says, The Lord God is my strength. Can you say that today? The Lord God is my strength. When you allow Him to be your strength, it becomes personal. It's no longer just a religious teaching. It becomes a personal experience. Then we go on to another verse that we talk about, and it's in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 5 and 6. It says, A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. We're talking about men who don't just do the thing they want to do. When they put the thing together, yes, use the instructions, guys. Don't throw it to the side. You know what it's like? The guy gets a toy and they throw the instructions away because they want to do it their way. Well, it says there the wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wisdom, counsel, wise counsel, you will wage your own war. Why Life sometimes can seem like you're in a battle. It can seem like situations are overcoming you. My, my wife and our girls left on Sunday night. We started a new tradition in our family. And they took the, she took the five girls with her into Edmonton and stayed at my mother-in-law's condo in Edmonton. And they, they went shopping for two days straight. And I stayed home with the men. And myself and the five guys are at home. And we had some man bonding time. We ate pizza. We cooked, cooked chicken wings and French fries. And we did all the things you do when mum's away. And we had the movie night and everything everything. And, and so we brought out the games and I set up a challenge. My wife and I had been talking about this for a few months now, building some bonding time. So I made up these challenges. We did with a BB gun. We went out there and made a, a little range and we did some shooting on there with a BB rifle. And, and then after that, we, we started to do some weights challenges. We, the guys did push-ups, sit-ups, chin-ups, and we got to do that. And then, then we did some, some bench press. And my son, he's 160 pounds and he lifted at 180. I couldn't believe Jay and he weighed, he lifted up my weight on, on the bench press. And I'm not saying what I lifted, but it wasn't quite that. And so he, we did the challenge that you lift, you lift the weight and then you divide it by your weight that you are. And I was hoping that I was a little bit less, less you know, I would have done a bit better. And so Jabek, my other son, lifted up 195 pounds. And I'm thinking, wow, he's only 150 pounds. He was making me feel like I was, un, you know, not, not able, not capable. But when you get into these situations, you know you have God. Someone say the God factor. God is on our side. So we went into the first few events and my team was getting beaten, three guys against three guys, and we got to Monopoly. And uh, who's ever played Monopoly? And in our, in our home, our house rules in Monopoly, uh, whenever you have to pay something, you put it in the middle of the board and you land on free parking and everybody gets what's in the middle. Has anybody played that rule? Okay, don't let anybody lie to you. That's actually not in the real rules. That's a house rule. And uh, so my wife and I, when we first got married, she played Monopoly with me and she'd trounce me all the time. So I came up with some new house rules of my own. And I'd, I'd do it secretly, but as I'm playing Monopoly, I'd, I'd get someone would pay me for landing on one of my properties. I'd put 10% in the middle. Oh, I'm believing to land on another property. I'd put a $20 or a $50 in the middle and I'd believe, come on, God. And I wouldn't say it out loud because I don't want people to know what I'm going to. And you might say I'm crazy involving God in a little game of, of Monopoly, but I believe it works. And it does work for me. And so here we are, we're, we're playing this game and I have two guys on my side and, and I started doing this. And I, to my surprise, my other two sons are doing this as well. 
So they've heard about these stories of dad and they know this works. So the three of us are doing this and we're believing and, and Jake and lands on the, you know, the most expensive two that are on the board, you know, just before you go past go, the two dark blue ones, well, he lands on the first one. And for about three or four rounds, no one's hitting the second one. So I'm putting my $100, my $200, come on, God, I'm confessing, and, you know, very quietly. And then Jake, Jake and lands on it. And we're like, yes. And then we find out that one of their players isn't doing this and the other two are. And they're, and they're looking at him and they're saying, you got to do this. they got an unfair advantage. they got God on their side now. You, you, you're taking the team down. And so I'm encouraging. I'll say, no, don't, don't worry. Don't pray. Don't tithe. You don't have to do it. It's okay. And long story short, by the end of the game, we owned the whole board. I felt like Donald Trump. Well, not quite Donald Trump. It might have, it might have been someone else. I don't know. But I felt, I felt like someone who finally was a winner. And I, and I had all my motels. And Jake had his motels. My other son had all his things. And they were just, they didn't even have a shoebox. We weren't playing Monopoly for going any further, but that was it. And I just want to encourage you that God's on our side. I like to do this also with chess. I like to play chess, and that's why I put the two chess pieces on the thing here, and it represents the game of life. But in chess, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's like warfare and different things like that. Sometimes life can seem like you're out of your league. And if I've ever played chess with you, or if you've ever had a game of chess with me, you'll find out if I play for myself, I'm not a very good chess player. And, uh, but if I play, you might see me, and I start to, you know, I'm sort of thinking, looking like I'm thinking. Well, I'm not that intellectual. <laughs> I'm actually praying. I'm, Lord, help me, show me. Give me the idea. Show me what their strategy is. Show me where they're attacking me where I can't see. And I literally do this. And there's sometimes where I'm about to move a piece and I get this, you know, the check in your spirit or the thought or the feeling, don't do that. And I'm like, whoa, I know what it feels like when God says, don't do that. And so I'm like, okay, where else can I move? And I, and I do this. And you find out later on, if you start to learn to do this, that you can actually play better beyond your ability because it's not your strength, it's God's ability in our lives. And if we have a look, I'll prove it to you biblically that you can do this. I don't know how I'm going to prove it, but I'm going to have a go. It says in Proverbs, sorry, let me go to Ephesians. It says in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work in us, he is able according to, he is able according to, if we will allow his strength and his power to come into any area of our life, whether it be a monopoly game, whether it be a game where we're playing chess or some other game where they're doing, I didn't pray when we're doing push. I don't think prayer would have helped me with that bench press, but whatever it was, it may have. But the thing is, is will you allow God's strength to come in and move through your life? I wrote a letter this week to the people that I pray for. I pray for everyone in the church, but we have some people that have emailed me, and I have the email, and I, I send an email message out each week. I sent this out on Saturday, and it said, when was the last time that you allowed God's power or strength to work in you? Allowing God into the situations of your life. Because this doesn't just work in games like chess or checkers or, or you know, challenges with men. It works in life. God comes and he's a strength. If you allow that strength to work in you, he'll make you able. Our children have seen my wife and I many times in our lives flip homes. And the moment we make some money on a particular project, we usually take 10% of that out and put it straight into the church. And then we take an offering out and we believe and pray and say, Lord, we pray for favor. We pray for direction. We pray for good deals. And then when we sell it, that we'll make a lot of blessing money off that. And so we put that in and we believe. And they've seen it work time and time again so now they've done three or four projects themselves as our, our children three of my boys now have just bought a vehicle and they found it got it and they they bought a motor another new motor for it and put it in and they, they're going to actually try and double their money and they've done this using God's principles and they're also believing so you can bring God into any area of your life your work your marriage your family your finances these are just illustrations that I'm bringing up today my question to you today is, are you activating the strength that is available? My wife wants to share practically today how you can be able to welcome God's strength into specific areas of your life so you can win in every area of life. Turn to the person beside you this morning and say, I am strong. I am strong. 
And so we want to look at a few areas and what can we do, what can we activate in our life that's going to bring fresh strength into our week. Because we recognize that tomorrow's Monday, the next day's Tuesday, the next day's Wednesday. We need a fresh strength over our life this week. So the first one is faith. Faith will bring a fresh strength into your week. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38 says, And now the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. So that means that faith is not optional if you want to walk in strength. If you want to walk this week in the strength of God, if you want to have a fresh strength around your life this week, then faith is not optional. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 says that God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And so that means that every single person already has faith on the inside of them. There's not one person who can say, I don't have any faith. No, God has given each person a measure of faith. And so it's our job to grow that faith, to develop that faith, to mature that faith, but every person has faith. Turn to the person beside you and say, I'm so glad I'm sitting beside a person who has faith this morning. Romans chapter 1 verse 11 says, you will grow stronger in your faith. So you will grow stronger in your faith. Your faith will grow stronger. And so faith enables us to live in the strength that God has for us. And you are strengthened when you speak in faith about your future. The Bible tells us that God has a good plan and a good future in store for you, Jeremiah 29, 11. And if you speak in faith over your future, you are strengthened and you are stronger. And if we look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42 to 46, we read about Elijah, and he was praying for rain. And it says, so Ahab went to drink and eat, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go and look out towards the sea. And the servant went and looked and returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him, go and look. Finally, on the seventh time, his servant told him, I saw a little cloud, the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And Elijah shouted, climb into your chariot, go home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. And soon the sky was black with clouds and the wind was heavy and there was a great rainstorm. And then it talked about how God gave Elijah supernatural strength to run faster than the chariot. But I was thinking about this story and how it pertains to our life. Is that sometimes when you're looking at your future, sometimes you don't see anything. Sometimes you can look and you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You don't see anything. And what you have to do is you have to go back and look again. Sometimes when you look at your marriage, you might not see anything, but you need to go back and you need to look again. Sometimes when you look in your bank account, you might not see anything, but you need to go back and you need to look again. And so Elijah kept sending his servant seven times. He kept saying, go back and look again. And the servant would come back and say, I don't see anything. And then Elijah would say, go back and look again. And the servant would say, I don't see anything. And then finally on the seventh time, I believe the servant was like squinting, looking like there's something. I got to see something this time. I don't want to have to keep running back and forth and back and forth. I got to see something. I got to see something. And he pressed with faith to see something in that moment. And he said, I see something small. This a cloud, it, it might be the size of a man's hand, but I see something. Do you know when we see something with the eyes of faith, we are drawing our future to us. We have to go back and look again. We have to take that next look in faith. So when you're looking at your life and you're looking at your future and things may not look the way you want them to, can I tell you, go back and look again. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hope for and the evidence of things not yet seen. And I remember when I was pregnant with my first child, I was five and a half months pregnant and that baby died. And when I looked at my future, the doctor had told me, Carmen, you'll never have children and, and gave me this whole kind of medical report. And when I looked at my future, I saw nothing. But then I remember learning about faith and learning about God and learning about what Jesus could do. And I began to start looking at my future and squinting and looking to see something. And I read in Psalm 128, it talked about the children will sit around your table strong and mighty. And, and I began to look forward into my future and see something that didn't yet 
exist. See, when I was given the negative doctor's report, I remember I was told you'll never have children, and so I would just tell people, I don't want kids. I mean, I was kind of like, you know, they, they cry, they poop, they cry, they poop. I mean, you know, all these different things, right? And so I was like, I don't want to have children. But what I was doing was masking my own pain because I was told I couldn't have children. But then when faith began to arise, I was stronger and I could look into my future and see something that did not yet exist. See something that would defy a medical report. See something that would defy my own pain that was in my life. And you need to look forward with the eyes of faith in your own life. And you need to go back and look again and again and again. Seven times you might have to look again and again until you see something with the eyes of faith. So that when you look at your marriage, you see something with the eyes of faith. When you look at your business, you see something with the eyes of faith. When you look at your family, you see something something with the eyes of faith. When you look at your doctor's report, you see something different with the eyes of faith. And when you see something different with the eyes of faith, then speak it out. Say, I see something. Elijah's servant said, I see something, but it's small, but I see something changing. And Elijah said, that's all it's going to take. Get ready. Get running. We got to get going because I hear the sound of an abundant rain that is coming our way. When you begin to speak something in faith, because you saw with new eyes, the eyes of faith, you are strengthened, you are stronger, and you are able to continue in victory. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please God. We need to have our faith muscle working on a regular basis. This isn't something that we have a moment of faith, but we are to have a lifestyle of faith. Mark chapter 11 verse 22, it said that Jesus said to his disciples, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have another look. Have another look. No matter how bleak the situation might be, have another look with the eyes of faith and allow yourself to be strengthened. When it comes to faith, I want to give you a few tips of faith. Faith, is, is, faith in God is the secret to solving any problem. Whatever problem you have, you may think nobody else has ever been there before. You're the only person who's ever had this situation. Can I tell you that is not true? Somebody else has already walked that journey. Somebody else has already lived in faith in that journey. Somebody else has already got the victory on that exact same path. And so having faith in God, this is the secret to solving any problem. Faith connects you to Jesus, which is the source. And he knows the answer to every situation that you face. He knows the answers. And you know, most believers don't go to him to find out the answers. How many of you have ever written a test? And if they told you, here's the answer key, you're not cheating, I'll just give it to you, you're allowed to have it, how many would take the answer key? Okay, the rest of you. You should take the answer key, okay? But Jesus has the answers. So by faith, we can go to God and we can get the wisdom that we need. Faith connects us to Jesus, which is the source. Faith is growing and strengthened as we study the word of God, as we read the word of God, as we come to church and we hear the preached word of God. That's why the Bible says that faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. By faith, you receive all the wisdom that you're going to need. By faith, you can go to God and you can ask God for any situation, no matter how complicated it is. God will give you wisdom. The Bible says you don't have wisdom because you have not asked him for wisdom. We go to God and we get the wisdom that we need by faith. And faith always works by love. So when you ask God for help, Forgive anyone who's wronged you because your faith becomes dormant with unforgiveness. Forgive people who have wronged you. Whether they say they're sorry or not, forgive people because your faith is strengthened and your faith comes alive when you walk in love. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. Turn to the person beside you and say, I am strong. What will bring fresh strength into your life this week? Number two, growth. As we grow, we are stronger. If you look at plants, plants that are not growing are dying. Isn't that true? If you see a tree and it stops growing, it's dying. If you see a plant and it stops growing, it's dying. And it is the same for a believer. When a believer stops growing, they are dying. 
And Romans chapter 4, verse 20 to 21 says, But he did not doubt or waver in unbelief concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong and empowered by faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that God had the power to do what God had promised he would do. We are to grow in strength. We are to grow in faith. And God wants us to continually grow. In fact, Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says that Jesus grew in favor with God and with man. Jesus grew. And so if, Jesus, if it's good enough for Jesus, how many think it's good enough for us? We are to be growing believers. We are to be advancing. We are to be learning. We are to be growing on the inside. And everyone needs to grow. Turn to the person beside you and say, I need to grow. Everybody needs to grow. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10 says this. But he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness, my mercy are more than enough, always available regardless of the situation. For my power is being perfected and is completed and shows itself most effectively in your weaknesses. For when I am weak in human strength, then I am strong, truly able, truly powerful, truly drawing my strength from God. So this morning I was, I was thinking about my life this week as I was preparing this message and I was thinking, I have a lot of weaknesses. I have a lot of areas of my life that I have a lot of weaknesses. One is that I'm a very opinionated person. I know it's going to probably surprise you this morning, but I'm a very opinionated person. And I'm a very strong person. In fact, my husband, he said that when he had his list of what he wanted in a wife, he said, I don't want a yes girl. I don't want a yes woman. He said, I want a woman who's strong. And so I often say to him, did you get more than you bargained for? You know, like, you know, did you get a little more than you bargained for? But I'm strong and I'm opinionated. And so there's some areas of my life because of that opinion age. I mean, how many know that opinions can get you into trouble? Just having an opinion. I mean, everybody has opinions. They're kind of like armpits. Most of them stink, right? And so, you know, everybody has opinions. And so because I was opinionated, that could get me into a lot of trouble. But, you know, where we're weak, God says, I want to make you strong. And so when God comes upon that very weakness that you have and he strengthens you and he makes you strong in that area and he begins to grow you in that area and you allow his strength to come upon your life in the very area that you were weak, then something happens. I believe you are a sign and a wonder. Maybe you're a bit of a hothead and you, you know, you get angry, but you allow God's strength to come on that weakness and you are a sign and a wonder. People just can't understand. How can you control your temper? How have you been able to change? It's not by my strength. It's by God's. Maybe you're a person who's, you know, kind of tight and kind of stingy and all of a sudden you become a generous person and people say, how's that possible? They've always been a stingy person. It's not by my strength. It's by God's power, God's strength on me. Maybe you're a person who, you know, you struggle with addiction and people say there's no point that they're never going to be able to overcome they've had this addiction for so long and all of a sudden you overcome you are a sign and a wonder because you know it's not by your strength it's by God's strength and God wants to put a strength on the very area that you are weak and so you never have to be ashamed of your past. You never have to look at your past and it be something that you try to cover up and you try to hide and you hope nobody finds out about. No, you're okay with people knowing about the areas that you are weak because you have a, a good God who has made you strong, who has made you victorious in the very areas that you could not overcome without him. And so God says, I want to make you strong. And so we have to grow in this strength. And we have to allow God to allow him to grow us from the inside. Everybody makes mistakes. Turn to the person beside you and say, I've made a few mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. But what's important is we grow. What's important is we don't stay stuck in that rut making the same mistakes over and over and over again. What's important is we recognize the scripture that his grace is sufficient for me. It will empower me. It will strengthen me. That where I'm weak, God says, I want to make you strong in that very area. I want my strength to shine through you that the world will know that God is alive, that God is supernatural, and that he can help you in the very areas where you are weak. When we are weak, God will make us strong. Stephen Furtick said this, too often we overestimate what we can do without God and we underestimate what we can do with God. 
We can do a lot with God. But the Bible says, without God, apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing, nothing of lasting value. And so I want to look at the word grow because Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, finally grow strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. He tells us, grow strong in the Lord, grow strong in God, not just strong in your own mind, grow strong in God. And so the word grow, G, grow in grace. Grow in the grace of God. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, my child be strengthened by the grace that is in Jesus Christ. Grow in grace. Grow in that supernatural ability to overcome. That's what grace is. It's the supernatural ability to be able to overcome and live in victory in the area that you used to struggle with. Grow in the grace of God. Letter R, grow by reading. Reading the word of God. Getting yourself trained with good resources. Get yourself into MTI where you can train for your purpose. Begin to grow by resourcing yourself and reading and learning and challenging challenging yourself to learn more so that you can grow. Letter O is to grow in optimism. Allow your eyes to see with the eyes of faith. It's easy to see a problem, isn't it? It's easy to see a problem. It's easy to see a complication. It's easy to see something that looks like it's going nowhere. But grow in optimism. Grow with the eyes of faith where you have to look maybe seven times. But grow where you can look and say, I see something changing. I see something different. Grow in optimism. And the letter W, grow by working your faith practically. Not just hearing the word, but now putting the word of God into practice in your life. James chapter 2 verse 26 says, so faith without works is dead. And 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 8 says, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants to make you productive and useful in what you know about the Bible. It's not just to have a Bible study. It's not just to read the Bible so you can say, I can quote a scripture. No, that you are productive and you are useful. That you are productive in the things of God, that you are growing, that things are changing, that you understand how to implement the word. And you're taking that word. You're asking the Holy Spirit, how do I work this word into my life? How do I allow this word to become life to me? How do I allow it to change me from the inside out? Allow yourself to grow and grow by the word of God and grow by working your faith. The last one this morning, what will bring fresh strength to me this week? The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. You know, we are strong when we use the name of Jesus. Proverbs 18 verse 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run to it and they are safe. There's something about that name of Jesus that you just have to sometimes whisper it. Sometimes you need to shout it. Sometimes you need to just say it. Sometimes you need to sing it, whatever it is. But there's something about the name of Jesus that it alters things. And most of us have been in situation where we went somewhere and someone has told us, when you get there, just drop my name. Use my name and you're going to get a little extra favor. You're going to get, you know, you're going to get a better deal or you're going to get an upgrade or whatever it is. But there's something so much better about the name of Jesus. It's so much greater than any earthly name. It brings us so much more because the name of Jesus has in it the power to strengthen us, the power to overcome, the power to use that name to to speak into a situation and allow that situation to be changed because of the name of Jesus, to speak that name of Jesus over our own heart when our our emotions might be, you know, fluctuating and going a bit crazy. We begin to say the name of Jesus over our own self. When we begin to speak the name of Jesus when we are afraid or there's fear in our life and we begin to say the name of Jesus, things change and we are strengthened because of the name of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 verse 10 says, and at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things that are under earth. The name of Jesus, everything will bow to one name, the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 3 verse 16 says, and by his name and through faith in his name, this man who have you've seen and recognized is well and is strong. We are strengthened by the name of Jesus. There's something incredible about the name of Jesus. 
And you know, sometimes believers, we forget about the name of Jesus. We go through our week. We go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're going through our week, and we forget about the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus that will strengthen us, the name of Jesus that empowers us, the name of Jesus that changes things in prayer when we pray in the name of Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 13 to 14 says, In solemn truth I tell you, anyone believing in me, Jesus said, shall do the same miracles I have done. Turn to the person beside you and say, You will do the same miracles that Jesus did. Isn't that great? It says, You will do the same miracles that I have done and even greater ones. Because I'm going to be with the Father, and you can ask for anything using my name, and I will do it for you, for this will bring praise to the Father because of what I, the Son, will do for you. Yes, ask anything using my name, and I will do it. So Jesus said, you've seen what I've done on earth. You've seen that I've opened the blind eyes. You've seen that I've healed. You've seen how I've been able to change situations. You've seen how I spoke to the the storm, and I've spoke to the waves. You've seen what I've done, and you will do what I've done, and even greater works, because you have my name, because you have the name of Jesus. We are strong when we remember the name of Jesus. We are strong when we speak the name of Jesus. And Acts chapter 4 says, For Jesus the Messiah, for there is salvation in no one else. Under all of heaven, there is no other name for which men can call to be saved. There's no other name but the name of Jesus that can bring salvation. There's no other name that can change an eternity's destination except for the name of Jesus. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, it says, confess with your mouth, Jesus. Confess with your mouth that name, Jesus, and you will be saved. You'll be born again. You come into the kingdom. There's something so precious about the name of Jesus. Can I encourage you this week that God wants you strong? He is strengthening you from the inside out. Allow your faith to rise up this week and strengthen you. Allow yourself to grow this week. Don't just stay at the same old, same old, have the same week that you have any other week. No, allow the word of God to grow you. Allow yourself to be stretched and to grow and to change and allow God to work on those very areas that you are weak and make you strong. And do it through the name of Jesus. Not through your own name, not through your own might, not through just your own strength, but through the strength of the name of of Jesus. And if you do that, you will go from strength to strength to strength. Close your eyes today. I want to pray with you. If you're watching with us online, we're going to pray in just a moment. And I encourage you that as we pray here as a community of believers, that we're also going to activate our faith and we're going to agree with you in prayer as well. So if you're in this room today, and maybe you're in a situation where you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never called upon that name and said, Jesus, I need you. I need your strength, Jesus, in my life. Or maybe you're in a position where you say, I've done it, but I've walked away. I've been just relying on my own strength. I've been relying on my own intellect. I've been making my own decision, and I've been trying to make my own path. And yet today you recognize, God, I need your strength. I'm a better man with your strength, God. I'm a better woman with your strength, God. My weaknesses become strong when I'm in you, God. When I come to your word, you strengthen me, God. When I'm a person of faith, you make me stronger, God. And so today, if you recognize there's been a bit of a gap there, and you say, I want to close that gap, and I want to come back to you, God. I I want to come back and get my strength from you, Jesus. If that's you with no one looking around for just a moment, just slip up your hand today. I want to pray with you if that's you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Anybody else needs to do that today? Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Anybody else that you need to do that today? Okay, I want to encourage everyone to pray this prayer with me. If you're watching online, pray this prayer out loud with us today and say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, Jesus, I open the door of my life, and I invite you, Jesus, into my heart. I thank you that you make me strong, that you help me, that you empower me, and so I thank you that you're going to help me, that you're going to empower me, and you're going to order my steps. In Jesus' name, amen. So I had
have your tithe and offering message this morning. And I want to look at Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3 to 4. And it says, any enterprise is built by wise planning. Say wise planning. Wise planning. Become strong through common sense and profits wonderfully. So we can see when it comes to building our financial life that we are to have wise planning and we become strong through the common sense, through the principles of the word of God and that brings profit into our life. But I like how it says that it's built on wise planning. And Isaiah 32 verse 8 says, But generous people plan to be generous. They plan to do what is generous and then they stand firm in their generosity. Isn't it awesome to know that generosity isn't just a mood, it isn't just a feeling that we have, it isn't just an emotion, it isn't just that moment when all of a sudden I feel generous now. No, real generous people, they plan to be generous. It's in their plans, they foresee it, they have a plan to live with generosity in their life. And I don't believe it's just for a season of their life, but for their entire life, they plan to be generous. And when we have wise planning in our life, what that does is it sets us up to prosper in our life. And if we plan to obey the word of God, we plan to be generous by returning the tithe and then sowing our offerings, we are positioning ourselves under the favor of God. And so it takes time for us to understand the principles of God, and then it takes time for us to be able to put those plans into our life. But when we begin to function under the plans and the principle of God, he will prosper us. In this verse here, it says that you will profit wonderfully. And so this morning, as you return the tithe that already belongs to God, as you give your offerings this morning, we want to agree with the word of God. We want to stand in faith on the word of God, that as we plan to be generous, not just for today, but we plan for our entire life, that we are going to be generous people. For our entire life, we are tithers. For our entire life, we are sowers. We are givers. As we plan to be generous, that God's ability to prosper us will, be, will come upon our life and enhance our life and build our life so that we are in a position where we can can always give again and again. And that's what we want to agree for today. So if your preferred method of giving is debit or credit, you can do so at the back of the auditorium. If you're watching with us online, you can give online. But let's speak the word of faith over our giving this morning and agree in prayer. So I encourage you to place your hand on your envelope. Father, first of all, today we thank you that you are a great provider. And God, we thank you for your provision over our life this week. We thank you for your goodness, God, and God, that you are a good God. And so, God, we recognize that everything we have comes from you. We look to you, that you are our source. You are our provider. And now, God, we plan to be generous, God. We plan to return the tithe and be tithers for the rest of our life. God, we plan to be seed sowers, that we sow our offerings, God, for the rest of our life. And Father, we thank you that your word declares that when we give, it will return to us in a greater measure. And so, God, we thank you that it is coming back to us in a greater measure and that we will be in a position where we can always be generous. And so, Father, we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you should give today.